Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Power Up Your Databases. This event is brought to you in partnership with Nutanix and produced by Actual Tech Media. Now, I want you to know that this event is part of a larger series of events that you need to be aware of. Uh, this event, uh, if you registered for this event, you'll receive invitations to all of the upcoming database events in the series. So make sure that you you know, keep an eye out for those invitations in the future. Uh, there are a number of uh, op awesome episodes in this event series. I count uh, seven, I believe, in total. So uh, just keep your eye out for upcoming invitations to the Power Up Your Databases webinar series. Again, brought to you in partnership with Nutanix. Now, before we get started, just a little bit of housekeeping information that you need to be aware of. Uh, my name is David Davis of Actual Tech Media. I'll be serving as the moderator on today's webinar. We want this to be an educational event. I see a number of comments already coming in there in the questions tab. If you haven't seen the questions tab yet, uh, it's to the left of the slides window. If you click on the word questions, and it's there that you can enter your technical questions about today's topic. We'll be doing a dedicated Q&A session at the end of the presentation, so get your questions in early, and we'll be doing our best to cover all of those questions at the end of the presentation. We'll have a live demo, and we, we also have a number of handout resources available there in the handouts tab. Make sure that you check those out. There's quite a few of them. I'm not going to list them all out. Uh, the most important one I think there in the list is the link to test drive the ERA solution from Nutanix. So check that out and also download the two PDFs uh, where you can learn how to turn your databases into a service and five reasons to run your databases on Nutanix. But there's a lot of resources in the handouts tab again. Make sure you check those out. And then finally, we'll be awarding the Visa $300 gift card at the end of today's presentation. If you're watching this on demand, I'm sorry, the drawing has already occurred. The prize terms and conditions can be found in the handouts tab. And with that, I'm excited to introduce you to today's expert presenters. They are Mr. Chris Papp, Solutions Marketing Manager at Nutanix, and Mr. David Teague, Technical Marketing Engineer, also at Nutanix. Chris and David, thank you for being on the event today. Thank you. Thank you for the introdu introduction. Yes, thanks a lot. Awesome. And we'll, with that, I'll hand it over to you guys to uh, take it away. Thank you. Today, uh, our topic is power up your databases, uh, build your core with the hyperconverged platform for databases. Uh, what we'll be going through today, I want to walk through a quick agenda. We're obviously going to be talking about the benefits of what a hyperconverged infrastructure uh, that Nutanix brings to the table can do for your databases, just right off the bat uh, for your infrastructure. But we're going to tie that into, um, you know, databases as a service that's custom built for our specific HCI and what that means in terms of uh, time savings, operational simplicity, uh, and overall uh, performance and uptime for your uh, databases as well. So there's a just kind of quick walkthrough. Um, and then at the end of this, as we're, as we're walking through some of these topics, make sure just to reiterate what uh, David had said earlier, uh, start popping your questions in and we'll be more than happy at the end of this to talk about it. So when we talk about a uh, databases on Nutanix or a database solution, what are we talking about exactly? Uh, we have a lot of different um, offerings from Nutanix um, that tie in, but when you think about what we're known for um, as a basis of uh, you know, what we started with, it's our HCI, it's our infrastructure, and it's that hyper-converged bar at the very bottom. Um, and when we kind of talk about that, that's uh, you know what we built our DNA on is web scale infrastructure, right? We built from the ground up. There were no parts taken off um, the shelf. Uh, we built with cloud in mind and building that for the private data center. And then we kind of built from there. As you see, like we have opportunities for you know securing your environment with flow uh, and things that are built right into AOS, like such as encryption, uh, consolidating your data with volumes and objects. Objects is um, you know, object storage, obviously, and Vimes is the, the ability to partition storage out. Um, and then what we're going to be kind of tying into HCI for databases is that ERA level. And ERA is our database as a service platform. Um, and there's, you can definitely deploy a database with Calm, and we'll talk a little bit about that, and Calm and Flow and how to segment out a database from like a security perspective. Um, and then we have uh, something that's not on here, but we talk about seamless hybrid cloud experience. Um, 
they went GA today was our Nutanix cluster offering, which gives you the ability to put Nutanix clusters on AWS today. So um, for the customers that are looking to manage their entire database estate uh, using ERA, or if you're not using ERA, if you're using Prism to kind of manage that from a single pane of glass, your entire infrastructure, um, and actually truly have a seamless hybrid cloud experience, uh, you can do that as of today. David, when we talk about these things too, one thing I want to point out, um, and you know more than anybody because you used Nutanix before coming over to Nutanix, is we have Oracle, MariaDB, MySQL, SQL Server, and Postgres listed as support. But as you know, we actually support a lot more than that, right? So like DB2, SAP, uh, down the line, these are those specific databases are just for um, support for a database as a service. But we have a there's a litany of databases that work well and that are supported, and um, we have architectural references for um, in uh, for running on Nutanix. In fact, David Teague's team is part of that team that helps build out those uh, documents. And we are adding new databases to Era as we go, anyway. So <laughs> some of those you Absolutely. mentioned. Are probably on the note on the list to be added into era support later on. Absolutely, good point. So we'll kick this off. Um, you know, as I talked about, Dave, before we jump in scalability and performance, why don't you give a little background on yourself and what you do um, prior to coming to New Tanks and what you do today at New Tanks that makes you the you know kind of the expert um, to be able to talk about scalability and performance. So, uh, yeah, I was, uh, well, first on the database side, I've been uh, managing uh, database administrator probably for the past 20 years, mostly on the SQL Server side. Um, and then uh, before I came to work at Nutanix, I worked as the Nutanix administrator and I was the backup database administrator. It's uh, it's a, uh, what do they call it? A, uh, because someone knows I used to support databases, I always end up supporting databases, which which I enjoy. So at times, yes, uh, that has happened in the past, um, but always SQL Server. But, you know, when when I got to larger companies, you know, it was like where we were a small company, maybe we did just have one database. Uh, when I got to larger companies, we always ran into issues of, not issues, but we always had multiple database uh, engines, right? So, you know, last my last job before I came to New Chance, we had uh, SQL Server, Oracle, and uh, Postgres and MongoDB. So <laughs> all in use in production. Um, and so that's where something like what we'll talk about later, ERACOM would have been a nice tool for me to have while I was there. So when we talk about one of the key key components or differentiators when it comes to um, Nutanix HCI, walk us through what data locality means to Nutanix and what that essentially means of like what, what that means to how to improve performance for databases. Uh, so data locality is the secret sauce of our file system. I know mean, it's not really a secret sauce. We talk about it all the time. So I guess that doesn't make it a secret. Uh, but, uh, you know, it is what gives you performance. And it is exactly what it sounds like. It means the data, the hot data that is for that VM will stay on that same, that same node. So if you're looking at the diagram here, we have, you know, multiple nodes. And so, you know, the VM on node one, you know, all of its storage all of its data will stay on that storage local to that VM, uh, the hot data. Um, and mostly all the data, if it's possible. In fact, one of the things we talk about when designing uh, uh, a Nutanix implementation for a database server is um, to uh, make sure you have enough storage for your whole database, um, which, you know, in some cases, that's an easier thing if you're talking uh, two or three terabytes, but when you start getting the larger ones, that can become a different discussion. Uh, but that way, so the database's data stays local. So it never has to go out over the network to the other nodes to get it. And this makes it even faster than, say, if you were going to storage. I mean, you still have to go out of a fiber channel. You know, if with data locality, the data is going to stay in that same storage on that same node. So we all know nothing's faster than staying on the internal bus to retrieve data. So in other words, you're not incurring any latency from going over the wire to pull that data across. Correct. Yeah, even over uh, you know even over a 10 gig or 25 gig or 100 gig link, right? It's still internal. It's all using that internal backplane to talk to the data, and it's just going to be way faster. You kind of see it there on the diagram that Chris is showing. So 
that is great in terms of like just general performance, but when it comes to databases, how does that translate in terms for like most of the databases I worked were OLTP, but analytical databases, I, as I've been at Nutanix, have been like a, a lot of the asks today are like, how are we going to be able to manage a report um, and do analytics on the large amounts of data that they're pulling in, right? With data, um, the amount of data that's, that's, that they're hitting and, and keeping on premises or in the cloud um, is just growing at an, at an astronomical rate. Um, how does that translate into performance for both of those workloads for databases? So yeah, the data locality helps as we were saying. And, and the other thing is we have some Nutanix best practices that you follow when you're provisioning a database on Nutanix. And if you follow those best practices, if for some reason the data is not on that local node, um, it will engage all of our uh, controller VMs, our CVMs to retrieve that data for you. So, you know, because we are highly available, we write the data across, you know, multiple nodes. And so if that data has been cold or it's, it's been pushed down or, or maybe you have outgrown the, a single, being able to keep your data on a single node, a single uh, Nutanix node, the, the CVMs will come in and say, hey, I can go out and grab all of that data. And that also means like you're saying here, you're talking about, you know, scalability, you know, as you add those nodes, you also get more CVMs, you get more disk, right? It, it all adds up together. And, you know, that's an easy process to, to scale out your system. Um, and then of course, now you can use that processing power if you need to, that extra disk, those extra CVMs. So it's a combination of data locality, or, you know, if that data is not locally, I'm going to use, I'm going to power, you know, I'm going to use the power of all those CVMs in the cluster to retrieve that data for me. So in reality, hopefully, your users shouldn't be able to tell the difference between data that's local or data that's on another node. But it is going to be faster on a local node. <laughs> so it's a good point about in terms of like scaling out um, and performance. Um, the graph you're looking at right now is kind of data taken from an external report created by ESG um, that we have and where uh, specifically with SQL Server where they ran a node and pegged a workload on it and then they just added an additional load uh, as they continue to go and move forward with that. Um, and then I think they got up to, as this graph shows, four instances. And if you look on the right uh, vertical side, uh, that's latency that they're getting. Um, so seconds per transaction, um, but it's also like sub millisecond latency that they were getting as well. So the performance as they scaled out um, is great. So um, as I, when I, ever, I can, I can speak with experience like that meant a lot because when I was building out projects, a lot of times it's set up as a pilot project um, or um, as business increases, it doesn't mean that you have to forklift upgrade like you would with traditional um, legacy infrastructure, like to hold forklift upgrade your SAN, for instance, to get that the next capability performance and capacity. So this means is like your database environment keeps on growing and the performance uh, capacity um, and as well as the uh, storage capacity increases, you just can continue to add nodes. And nodes are very easy to bring up in Nutanix. Like you can have another node uh, spun up in the environment and then as David will kind of demonstrate later, you can spin up an instance uh, with best practices for that database engine and uh, Nutanix best practices built in uh, in a matter of minutes. And and there's a, the, 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 to circle back to what you're talking about too with the, the data locality performance, the scalability, um, you know, my, the first Nutanix cluster we bought, well, actually take it back, the second Nutanix cluster we bought at my last job, you know, we were buying general, you know, server, you know, it wasn't all SSDs, it was all hybrid. And because of the built-in functions of the HCI platform, of Nutanix's HCI platform with its file system and, every, and, the, and the way the CBMs work, um, you know, we were able to run our order system with a multi-terabyte database uh, better. <laughs> and, you know, part of that was we had more memory, better CPUs, but we went from a physical cluster to a virtualized uh, SQL always-on availability group cluster, and it performed better. And it was, you know, it was online a lot more. Um, in fact, I remember my boss telling me that, you know, they went from basically having monthly problems, um, and it wasn't all related to hardware, but monthly problems with the ordering system to, I think, 
you know, my last year I was there, we had two issues that were, uh, that problems and non, non neither one of those were related to Nutanix. See, like it was just, they, because the, the, the system was performing so much better. They just didn't have as many problems as they had before. So in other words, as you scaled your availability actually to still stay the same. Correct. Yeah. And that's it. That's a great, that's another thing I should talk about. We, we ordered a, we ordered four nodes uh, to grow our cluster. Um, and they showed up on the dock at two o'clock. Um, my network admins in that remote data center, um, were, I think they must've been bored or they really want to do something. They racked it, stacked it and cabled it. And, uh, we had them online and serving VMs in our, and that was an action the EX6I cluster at four 30 that afternoon. So showed up on the dock at two o'clock. We had it serving VMs by four 30 that afternoon. So two and a half hours. And, and literally that is not an exaggeration. <laughs> That's Great how story. quick it is. It's easy to scale up and scale out your system. And what's interesting about we that, had David, four is nodes. That, all four nodes were in there. What's interesting about that is that, like, as awesome as that story is, that's the common, uh, kind of common story for anybody that jumps into Nutanix as they, as they're scaling up resources. Um, I hear that story often, so it's not unique just to to you. It's like not uh, the best case scenario. That's the norm for Nutanix. When we talk about, we just talked about scaling out. Let's talk about scaling up. So you have the option of like CPU, memory, network, and storage. You can get up to 112 cores, uh, up to six terabytes of memory. We have different options for networking from 10 gig to 40 gig. Uh, and then we also have uh, all flash and VME uh, storage available. So uh, you can run mixed, a hybrid type of storage environment, or you can go all flash with your workloads. And there are certain workloads that require that, especially when you're getting into uh, some of the analytical workloads or um, like data warehouse type of workloads. Um, but we do show that with traditional, like, um, we recommend going off flash for certain types, but that depends on when you're talking to your, uh, SC on site, um, and they do some performance testing and like, where you think you're going to progress and grow. The good news about that is even if you don't go, um, with Nutanix, like right off the bat and you decide to run more of a hybrid environment, and then you decide later as requirements increase, you pop in a new node and then you just move your VM over to that um, with that has all the new requirements. So we have customers today that were started out with like a simple, like basic three node database cluster um, and then have scaled up uh, with, along with the rest of the environment uh, to a hundred node. Um, and as they get that, the good news about that, they started with us when we started um, 10 years ago. And then as the, as new technologies came in place, they were able to just V motion that, that VM over to the, to the new node uh, and take advantage of those new technologies that, that were coming out. Um, and the benefit of that as well is since we're a software defined company, we are a software company. We work on any type of hardware that's available um, that you can get those capabilities from like an update. Think of like uh, the, uh, the analog that would be like, a, you know, a Tesla that gets a, a speed increase from software update. Same thing is true uh, when it comes to um, updates coming from Nutanix and those updates are non-disruptive as well. So your environment stays up. Yeah. And that's a good point because that actually did happen uh, with uh, if you were running windows on uh, Nutanix AHV, when we released the vert IO 1.04 driver, um, it enabled multi-threading on the windows system for the disc. So they went from being a single, single connection. I shouldn't say multi-threader, but single disc queue to multi-disc queue writing. So it increased, there was a, there was a noticeable increase in performance when I did that for my SQL server that was running on, on Nutanix, as far as like, as far I, I say noticeable that that server wasn't pushed very hard. So my users didn't notice anything. I noticed it just from backups. It was just able to read faster. Good point. The slide that we're looking at now and the view that we have now is an example of, of like the distributed uh, storage fabric um, and how using uh, CVMs a controller, uh, VMs, how we're able to kind of manage that across all the different VDISs out there. Um, what that is, is uh, our ability to kind of scale that out across multiple nodes, but still keep that storage local. Um, and then using that with like an example here with HV is that you're able to map volume groups to a VM or enable volume group load balancing across that. Um, or with any hypervisor, like you don't have to use our specific hypervisor. 
Um, in your environment, you do not have to use HV, you know, if you're running SQL or Oracle. If you're using VMware, for instance, uh, you can run that as well, and then you still have Nutanix volumes and, and guest uh, um, iSCSI to connect to those. Well, and also the newer the newer version of, I believe it's 517, I, you don't even need the end guest iSCSI for Windows yeah. on HV. You'd still That's need it for point. ESXi. That's a good point. Um, I got a little ahead of myself too when I was talking about getting updates. Like one of the things that we've done that is specific to databases is because we don't have to change out complete hardware to get improvements, uh, we improved our core data path altogether. So uh, what that means is like with, well, it's, it's called autonomous extent store. We're able to, to, to take purpose-built heavy, write mission critical workloads and get a performance gain out of them. And that was just basically, if you were already running us, um, it was just a software update that you did on AOS. And like I said, that's not an outage that you have to take, or it's not like a forklift upgrade. Uh, everything stays up um, and you get the, you get the capability to do like dodge data set ingestion and get those performance uh, increases uh, with that. And that's just improvements to systems as well. And that, that was specifically for like large data sets and like databases or data warehousing. So we talked about performance. We're going to kind of switch gears a little bit and talk about cost optimization and what that means um, and how we are able to cost optimize uh, for a database specific. So one of the tenets of uh, Nutanix is to simplify. I mean, across the board, no matter what we're doing, is the idea is to simplify. And with that, the difference when we're talking about simplifying, we're talking about like when we're when you're taking that organization out of their traditional infrastructure, like their traditional like or legacy infrastructure that we call it, where it's you know separate silos of storage, separate silos of com compute, and they're all segmented and you're over provision in some areas and under provisioned on others. Um, so you have all these different uh, little pockets of silos that are also the, you have to have the ability to manage those um, as well. So where we kind of come in from just without looking at anything else where we're able to benefit people is from a licensing perspective because we're able to get rid of that those silos that uh, are in your environment and because you're able to run any workloads without them stepping on each other you're able to kind of roll those into uh just the new chance hci just the way the architecture is built you're not having to have these separate individual uh, build outs for every workload and so because of that you don't have as you don't have to have as much licensing net uh much licensing or database servers that you did before. What we usually see with customers is we're able to kind of take all those segmented databases and consolidate them down. Um, and then right in that, you have some cost optimization because you're saving on licensing. You're also saving on licensing, uh, not just for databases, but just you know whatever else you're running to manage those as well. It could be uh, OS licensing, um, or it could be um, just in terms of cost as well. Uh, that we'll jump into a little bit uh, in terms of management. So you can manage more um, with the same amount of people, uh, but you're not having them do break fix all day long or just chase down uh, tickets because they're actually able to get stuff up and running. Uh, and they're not instead of where they normally had like 15, there's now five, right? It's just uh, more capacity for that admin. We also have the capability to, when you're expanding out your infrastructure, if you're okay from a CPU perspective, but you're just growing like everybody else because all the data that's coming in um, and, you're keep, and your company's keeping it, then storage is sometimes some of the first things to go. So we have storage only nodes um, that where all they are are additional nodes that provide additional capacity and you bring that into your cluster. And so that doesn't, usually, that doesn't go against your licensing count for databases. Right, because there's not a CPU cost to it. You're not running any uh, databases on it. You're just adding additional capacity from a storage perspective. Yeah, we did this at my last job. We had a couple of cold storage nodes, and that uh, we ran that in our. Uh, for, it was an ESX I environment running on Nutanix to start with, and they did not show up as servers inside of ESXi either. So it was just more as far as VMware is concerned. We just had you know four nodes with. A bunch of storage but the Nutanix cluster was actually six nodes and two of them were storage only and the other thing i wanted to mention too is a great thing about cost optimization you know we can run um uh, hybrid nodes and 
all flash nodes in the same cluster. So one of the things we were looking at doing at my last job for our order system was actually ordering a couple of all flash nodes just for the database, for the, the SQL AAG group and a couple other um, important database servers uh, just to give them that extra kick of performance. But it wasn't, it didn't even have to be a separate cluster. We were just going to add those two nodes to that, um, to that cluster. I think we were probably going to do some, uh, you know, anti affinity rules just to keep the database servers on there, but it allows you to not have to buy, you know, just because you have a, a, a highly transactional database or some sort of very, you know, heavy IO requirement for databases doesn't mean you have to buy 20 nodes of all flash. You can just buy four nodes of all flash and maybe 16 of hybrid and that will help you save money down the road. So David, let me ask you in your, in your example, when you guys switched over, did you, were you guys, did you have a lot of bare metal instances or physical instance that when you came over to new tanks that you switched over to virtual? Yeah. And I mean, the first, the first thing I'll talk about is, you know, this is kind of a, I won't say this is just a Nutanix, uh, uh, um, performance, but going to virtualized SQL servers, you know, we had a four, or I, I see either a four or six node, uh, either, I think it was a four node and the two node clusters, physical clusters attached to, you know, storage on the back end, um, with all of our, almost all of our SQL databases on it in that, in our primary data center. Um, we went to, we built a SQL AAG group, a four node SQL AAG group, because the, the two node cluster, we already decided we weren't going to keep that a cluster, but we still had probably 10 or, they weren't large databases, obviously, but we had our main primary order database. And then we probably had six or seven, maybe, maybe eight different databases on that AAG cluster or that FCI cluster, the physical one. Um, we, we virtualized that, we built a four node cluster and we moved everything onto that same cluster. Um, very quickly because we knew uh, the Nutanix system itself was highly available and, and highly reliant. And, and virtualization gives you that to a certain extent because now, obviously, if you lose a server, you know, this, you know, this virtualization is going to move it over to a functioning server, right, with almost no perceivable downtime. Um, so what we ended up doing was instead of having, uh, we actually reduced our AAG cluster down to two nodes with a, uh, with a, uh, asynchronous secondary in a different data center and took databases off of there that did not need 24 seven uptime um, because we had several databases on our FCI cluster because, you know, we wanted to have that redundancy with physical servers. Right. But once we went to virtualize, we're like, we don't need, we don't need that kind of resiliency. These servers can be taken down to be patched after hours. Right. And so the only thing that ended up being on our AAG cluster was, was stuff that was required to be up 24 seven. And I think that was like three or four databases at most. Um, so what that allowed us to do was shrink our AAG cluster, which meant we weren't using um, SQL uh, enterprise licenses. We just able to use standard SQL standard licensing. So we actually did shrink our licensing costs, even though we kind of technically had more, uh, you know, we had the same instances, I should say, more database servers, the same instances, and uh, our license cost was cheaper. Interesting. Um, I will say what I have seen as well, um, has been the ability for customers that for one reason or another, they have a legacy environment that where they just can, they can't or they won't um, move it over to, to virtual. And what they'll do then is you still have the, the availability of, if you're on Nutanix and you can attach bare metal instances uh, using Nutanix volumes to um, Nutanix. And the benefit there is you're still able to kind of do a centralized management. So you're not having to jump into yet uh, a different interface to manage that infrastructure you can manage it all together uh with Nutanix and see you know kind of have that central pane of, of glass management so it saves on time and on troubleshooting and again we i've talked about it a couple times i've brought it up repeatedly but one of the big challenges with databases are the amount of database copies out there um you know gartner idc have all done uh uh reports on it uh, that huge $56 billion number is the estimated copy data cost for IT organizations. Um, some numbers to throw out there is that there's uh, 10 copies for each database, production database out there. So usually in my experience and what we've been talking about from performance is that storage is sitting on, um, you know, tier one storage, fast, expensive storage that's sitting out there. Um, and so that's a challenge in terms of managing it and supporting it and from a cost perspective, just because it gets so expensive. 
Um, and then one of the things that we can do with that is that we'll dive into a little bit is when you're managing those database copies, we can actually take clones of those and save 6x in storage because we're doing point in time snapshots and point in time clones or they're uh, a pointer. So the only things that change um, are, are the only time it's eating up space are the changes from that pointer and you're not losing any performance from using that. So you're able to what used to be when you had to do a refresh of the database for uh, reporting or you needed a copy for dev and you had to do it all the time or sometimes in some cases, especially for reporting where it's a nightly uh, update and it could take hours before you can get that done in a minute. So essentially we're taking the benefits of copy and paste from your desktop and putting that into your database management. Just um, that simple to, to clone a database. So let's jump into security real quick. Uh, I showed that graph earlier um, and David, I kind of talked about it where like all the products that make up uh, the new tank solution that you can kind of pick and choose. And we focus really on, uh, you know, the era and HCI component and AOS. Uh, but one of the big things that we can do, and David actually has a great demo um, that he's done before, um, where he's actually shown where uh, an example of uh, using micro segmentation with our flow uh, product. Um, and where you had a database that for one reason or another, I think the example David you gave was, uh, it was um, a zero day exploit that hadn't been patched or it was exploited. And so you need to segment that off. And you did that with micro segmentation fairly easy, fairly quickly, and got that patched and updated using um, our internal products uh, era. And then you were able to unsegment that and open it up to everybody. Yeah. And the great thing about Flow is it uses categories and it, it comes already with categories created for the popular databases. Um, so if you um, you can even have a rule that is set up ahead of time that's not enforcing that says, hey, I need to segment this this server off. And then you can, you know, basically enforce that rule. And now that server is segmented, uh, segmented, wow, segmented uh, from the rest of your environment. While maybe it's just open up the ports that need to keep it online, but maybe you've disabled, you know, RDP or anything related to that exploit that from, you know, any network, but maybe a maintenance or a management network. Yeah, and, and to that point, like this, what we're showing here is that you can use Era to manage that and patch it, and you can use Flow to actually um, segment it. And then if you can do that with an application as well, you can um, update that application or deploy it again uh, with Calm uh, in terms of using self-service. Or Calm can call out uh, if a ticket comes in. Calm using APIs can call out to Era to then update that environment. Right, and we'll talk about it more when we get into Era, but... Uh, the error, the way error uses software profiles can also help your security and patching, so, which I think, which is what we're going to show here. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a good segue. Let's walk us through, like, so what are some of the, the problems that happen with, with uh, a traditional patching environment, David? Like, as we're walking through this diagram, um, it's pretty straightforward. I know if you have a single database, but as you start getting multiple databases, um, have you experienced that it gets harder and harder to, to patch and keep up with those environments? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's always the ability to want to move forward or, you know, um, is what would happen to us too is, hey, you know, this database doesn't support SQL 2008 R2. Now we need to run on SQL 2012. And, and you know, we would have, we were run into some strange instances like that. And, and yeah, it very, all of a sudden where you may have had a very controlled environment with 10 database servers that were all running you know, Windows 2012 with SQL 2012. Well, you know, a, you know, two years later, now you're at 30 databases and, you know, half of them are running SQL 2016 on Windows 2012 and the other half are running SQL 2016 on Windows 2016. And so, you know, it's it just becomes <laughs> self-perpetuating to a certain extent. Yeah, and, and the the painful part of this is I, I've, I've been in environments uh, a quite a bit where you're testing out something or you roll something in production and there's unintended consequences of something going down because it wasn't the exact configuration. There are different patch levels or different um, install levels. And so you just don't have a standard built out. And so that becomes a problem um, unless you're actually having have something in place to manage those different configurations that are out there. Um, perfect example of this, we had a customer um, that was running um, in excess of 100 different uh, configurations. Uh, in their environment, um, and they were able to get that down to eight and get all their patching 
under control as well. So with that, their patching levels for test dev and production, uh, they had a total di of eight different uh, uh, configurations that they followed, and they, which allowed for them to troubleshoot a lot simpler and figure things out. So um, the, the ability time to resolution was a lot shorter. And so they were able to keep stuff, A, keep stuff running, and then when something did break, they were able to fix it a lot faster and resolve the issue for the customer. So let's jump into, before we get into our demo that Dave's in, one of the last things we're gonna roll into is our Davis as a service, which is ERA. So in a nutshell, we created a, a custom built for Nutanix HCI database as a service. So what does that mean? So if you take all the benefits uh, that people expect from the cloud, um, like one click provisioning, like the ability to quickly provision out um, and all the steps that are involved with traditional a process, a traditional process of building out a database server and deploying a database instance uh, is tedious and very error prone. We're able to automate that and set gold standards and deploy it very quickly. Um, you're able, we just talked about patching. That was a segue into that. So we're able to identify all the patches uh, that are needed out there. And through ERA, you're actually able to uh, patch those databases on your Nutanix environment. Um, so you have a, again, single point of reference for those database operations, see what needs it, see what doesn't, and then get them up to the same standard, um, either from individual points, um, or you can actually um, change, update the golden image that you have and then set it up that way. Uh, we have database protection, and that kind of ties in with copy data management. What do we mean by that? We have uh, zero byte snapshots uh, that you can take. So. Um, if you're familiar with virtualization, usually what happens is if you have a lot of snapshots that affects a performance because it's having to check to where it was written before, you don't have that problem on HV um, on Nutanix. So instead of doing the snapshots to like a SAN vendor or um, what we do is through ERA, we're able to manage those snapshots. And so you can go back and do an in-place restore if you need to. Um, you can set that as part of a schedule, um, a timetable, like every day, every hour, every 15 minutes, um, whatever you schedule based on the workload that's there. Um, so this way you have a point reference to restore back to. So if you have a deleted table, you can do an in-place restore uh, with a snapshot. Um, copy data management, uh, that entails cloning and snapshotting again, but cloning gives you the ability to uh, take something that's terabytes in size in terms of a database and then quickly and easily uh, in minutes um, clone that over to like your dev environment, your reporting environment, your application team. So sometimes we run into customers that, hey, they don't do a lot of cloning in their environment because it's so painful, manual, it's such a manual process. But what we do with that is, hey, we make it very easy. Again, using the term like copy and paste operations, um, we find that now they're able to get higher availability because now they have clones and then they have uniformity in data uh, across the dev and test environments. Um, the apps team are able to get updates very quickly because it's not, they don't take a, a hit on storage by having multiple copies. They're able to manage it and they're able to keep them updated. Um, and it's not something that we've had lots of customers that have come out where they had overnight processes from like, um, you know, eight hours or nine hours that would run where they'd have to pause operations, create a copy and move it over to where it went down to like everything was done in an hour um, and done repeatedly. So uh, huge improvements with that. We're API focused, so that means that you can plug into your ticketing uh, operations. Like we have videos up where, where um, service now ticket comes in, for instance, and requests a database, it kicks off, runs in, we're able to provision a, a database, a SQL Server database. Um, CLI and, and GUI operations, so whatever fits there, um, and we're able to kind of roll these databases out. The idea here is, again, we call one-click database operations. It's a central pane of glass. It's central management for all your database operations. Uh, remove all the manual errors that are out of there uh, that are in traditional database provisioning or just database operations, and you're getting that out the door, and and uh, you're able to manage it all from from one spot. So when we talk about that, so this is where we kind of show what's supported by um, Era. Um, there is SQL Server as of today, it's SQL Server, Oracle, Postgres, um, SQL, and MariaDB and MySQL uh, are all supported. And we're adding on to those and uh, keep your ears open for announcements, especially as .next comes up, or, which is our uh, virtual conference that will be uh, in the near future in September. Uh, we'll have some big announcements coming out as well. Um, but it sits on top of 
our HCI platform. So you're running clusters on, uh, you could be running uh, the example that David gave earlier. You could be running uh, an always on configuration in your environment uh, on Nutanix and then be able to manage that uh, using ERA. Um, and you're able to plug and real in quick, those. Yeah, when Chris was talking about in the last slide about um, cloning and patching uh, or cloning and provisioning, um, the, the reason it's fast to make clones, the reason it doesn't take a lot of space is we're using the, the native Nutanix snapshots and those are always space efficient. And also that means it's storage side. So when you tell your to make a, a clone or a snapshot for a backup of your database, um, you know, if it's doing it, you know, it'll do it application aware, it'll put that, it'll quiesce that database. Um, it will do it almost instantaneous because it's doing it on the storage side. Um, I used to do this a lot at my previous job where I managed our database servers. I had our Nutanix cluster snapshot all of our VMs every night. Um, and I never had anybody notice that the VM was being snapshot. now of course it was in the middle of the night. And so you're thinking lower usage, but I would also sometimes have to do this during the day because um, I actually did my Nutanix upgrades during the day. So I would snapshot all the VMs just as part of my process. And because it's all storage side, um, you know, my database users never notice any, they never notice the database being quiesced and unquiesced because it was that fast. Great point, great point. Yeah, it's like when I say it's custom made, we plug right into the Nutanix APIs to, to get all those advantages of, of speed and uh, storage reduction in terms of all your copies. So all the benefits are from the HCI platform. Um, I want to show you a quick slide that, we, that I like showing real quick on terms of uh, how complicated the database provisioning process. And this is actually a simplified, uh, much simplified kind of pared down process on why it takes so long to deploy a database. If you've gone through it before, you, you, you've had this headache before, you know the pain. I wanted to show this real quick um, of all the different steps involved uh, before David jumps into his demo, because you'll get to see kind of how easy it is to do it through Nutanix. Um, and he'll be, actually be in, in the UI and kind of running some of these operations. So when we talk about, you know, taking hours, days or weeks to deploy a database, like this is why you have multiple teams touching it, uh, manual processes, it's not a wash, rinse, repeat, it's, you know, done different ways each time, it means that all those configurations are out there. So even if you do get it up correctly, the troubleshooting later on down the road is different. So if you're supposed to have uniformity across production, dev and test, it's not there, uh, very complex as well. So, um, we're able to reduce that down to a couple steps and get standardization in your environment and as well as um, making it easier to deploy. So your database administrator or your systems administrator isn't spending all day deploying a database. You can actually delegate that off as well. So instead of hearing me talk about it, let me let David take over um, and share a screen. He'll be able to show you what it looks like. All right, so this is the the era interface, and as uh, Chris was saying, um, this is a purpose built system, mainly aimed at your database administrators. It's one of the few consoles that we have that's not in Prism uh, itself. Um, it is a separate console. Um, of course, that doesn't mean that your Nutanix administrator couldn't use it to deploy databases. Um, the the great thing about how it works is is you know the idea of this is we're trying to simplify our deployments. So as you can see here, this is the, the overview screen. Um, you can see here we have a, a cloning space saves on clone. So it's it's only using, you know, 1300 gigabytes and it's saving a whole lot of data. <laughs> uh, I can't read that right now because apparently my vision is being weird, but a lot of data. Um, and so um, you can also see your clones here um, on the front page here. But let's talk about what makes uh, what makes ERA tick. And that's our profile section. So the first thing we'll talk about is software profiles real quick. And now a software profile is the easiest way to think about it is, is it's a template or a, you know, a, an image like you would use in the virtualization environment. And basically to create um, your own image for your own company, you can point ERA at an existing database server. Um, it will install an agent. If it's on Nutanix, it will install agent. It has to be on Nutanix first. That's the one caveat. Once it's on Nutanix, we can ingest that into ERA. It'll install a small agent on the VM, VM or on the SQL Server VM, or the database server VM. Doesn't have to be SQL Server. It will ingest all that data, all that information about it. Once it's into ERA, you can then say create a software profile from that. And what that does is it's going to take all of the settings that you have for the OS and the database server and create a uh, create an image from that or a software profile. 
And so if you happen to be like, I used to have to deal with like NIST requirements and you had to harden your database server, it'll bring in all of those OS settings and it'll bring in all of those database settings. And then you can deploy from that over and over and over. And this kind of harkens back to what Chris was saying about where we had a customer that had 300 or so different com um, combinations of database servers and database engines. Um, and he went, they went down to just like eight configurations because they were deploying from a specific software profile every time. And we break them out into compute and network um, so you can use the same software profile. So if I make, take my production server and make a software profile, and then I'm saying, hey, I'm gonna deploy this as a development box because I want the same settings that we're using in production development. But you know what? My development box doesn't need, you know, uh, like this large, this large one here that says, you know, two vCPUs and 64 gigs of RAM. You can have a small compute that says, hey, I only need one CPU and 16 gigs of RAM. And then the network profile allows you to decide which network you want that server to live on. So you can take a single software profile and deploy it to any network with any compute size. And then if there are any specific DB parameters that you want to change, you can do that. So in our Oracle profiles here, you can see the different settings that we allow you to uh, customize for each deployment. So, um, you know, depending on your database size, you know, depending on attend on how much your table space and, and, and temp table space you have. Um, so it allows you even a little bit more step of customization so that when you deploy it, you know, you still only need one software profile. So you could have, uh, like we have in this environment here, you know, we have a couple of different software profiles, um, and then they each have a version. And this tells you all the different versions they have. And this is also where we do patching from. So once you create a version and publish it, um, at, right now for Oracle, coming soon for SQL and Postgres, um, once you publish that, um, new software profile with your patched versions on it, you can then uh, then start patching any server that was deployed from that same software profile. So that allows you to control what you're deploying, how you're deploying it, and you know what it is, right? So that that really, you know, as, as Chris said, we shrink down how much you're managing and the different variations of those, um, of those database engines and database servers are. So let's click here. I'm gonna do a real quick deploy. Um, as you can see, we support the five databases that Chris is gonna do. I'm gonna do Postgres real quick. And so, as you can see, you can do clustered or single instances. We do support cluster deploys of Oracle Rack, uh, a clustered Postgres, and as I mentioned before, SQL uh, availability groups. Um, I'm only gonna do a single instance. And because of the software profiles, it makes it real easy to already know what we want to do. Basically, you are back down to putting in just a, a database server name. So I'm just going to call this, you know, that test. And, you know, then you can choose your software profile. So if you do have multiple software profiles, you can deploy it. As long as you don't delete that software profile, even that version of it, it'll still there. I find that useful because I know there's been plenty of times in the past where we've patched something and two or three weeks down the road, an application person comes, hey, this thing's been acting weird since you patched it. Well, if that's the case, you can come back into ERA and deploy a version, that older version of that software profile to figure out if it actually was the patch causing the problem. So like we said, we're trying to simplify this. So we've already got our profile defined. We have our network defined. We can, you know, we have a dev and a prod network. And then from here, we just need to give it our database name. We're just gonna call this that web and give it a, a password and hit next. And then this is the time machine, which is where we take, uh, it sets our schedule for doing snapshots and log backups. And as Chris was saying before, we are fully API driven. So we, most of all of the error screens in here have this API equivalent button. And you can come in here and, 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 and give this script either for yourself or if you have someone using automation tools, obviously this will work with uh, Nutanix Calm, but it'll work with many of the other popular automation tools out there. And you can give them this script to do uh, exactly what you're doing and then they can make a playbook out of it. Um, and you know they can variableize the names and stuff so they can make it even to reusable over and over again. So yeah, and that's that's how you deploy a, a database in Chanix Era. You're like, and it's this process is 99% the same whether it is Postgres, SQL, MySQL, Microsoft SQL, or Oracle. 
Um, you know, when I first started the Nutanix, um, I think day two, I went into ERA and created a six node AAG group uh, or AG group SQL server. And it deployed and had the, the cluster online in about 40 minutes. Um, and it deploys it with all of the Nutanix best practices and all of the um, vendor best practices. Um, there's nothing ERA doesn't do that you can't do manually, but it does it all for you. And it, as a database person, you know, even though I was a Nutanix administrator at the last job and I helped the database guys out or the database guy, that's why I was also the database guy. Um, you know, trying to wait for someone to deploy a new server for you. Um, you know, you could do this from here. It will deploy a VM for you. It will uh, do it with the best practices and it'll be ready to go when it's done. And I'm just going to click through here real quick because I want to leave us some time to uh, answer questions. But as far as patching, um, if you have a patch available, uh, this one doesn't. <laughs> um, well, it shows up under here as patches. Oh, there you go, update available. So it'll just say update available. And when you click here, you have the ability to, to do it now or later. And if this was a cluster, it's gonna follow the cluster rules so that your database stays available for the whole time. And then one real last thing I want to show um, is our cloning here. As you can see, here's all of our clones. As I showed before, they were uh, space efficient, as Chris was saying, right? They're not taking up a lot of space. And to deploy those clones, it's it's a very uh, quick process. You go into our time machine and you say clone, and it defaults to the most recent one. You obviously can choose any of these dates that are here. And basically you give it a name and give it a password and a, and a database name and hit clone and it's off. And it, it will do that relatively quick because all it's doing is restoring a storage size snapshot. So depending on your size of your database, you know, it could be minutes, it could be, 50 minutes. Um, and we also have the ability to schedule, oops, wrong one, I'm not in the clone screen. So let's, in the clone screens here, you can obviously track all of your clones. And um, we have the ability to schedule that refresh. So you can say, hey, I want this database to be refreshed uh, every Monday morning so that when my dev guys come in, they have a recent copy of the a production database. And we also can schedule the removal. So if you know they're gonna be done within two weeks, you can tell it to to uh, to uh, remove that database. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing so we can uh, finish up and answer some questions, hopefully. Thanks for that uh, demo. Uh, I loved how it showed like in the quick, like even though it was a very quick demo, it showed like the four things that were shown here. And it's simple, fast, cost effective because you're saving storage, you're saving time, your DBAs aren't troubleshooting um, all day long. They're able to kind of focus on projects and, um, it's available and secure. So if you're setting up standards, I think one of the good things that showing if you're able to deploy those databases and you know which version, you don't have a bunch of different configs out there, your environment's gonna be just inherently more available. And the fact that you're putting it on HCI, um, where it has uh, built-in availability options from, uh, you know, if a disk, from everything from disk going bad or hardware failure, that it has failover options that are built into it as well. Um, and security, which we walk through, uh, from the patching that's available in ERA to like if you're using something from like flow to kind of micro segment your environment. Um, so with that said, I want to kind of point everybody some resources. If you want to know more about Nutanix.com, um, Nutanix databases are running any of the databases or, or ERA, go to Nutanix.com slash databases or Nutanix.com slash ERA. Uh, I kind of briefly brought up our our dot next uh, digital experience uh, that'll be September eighth through September tenth. Um, if you, and it's, it's free. free. Yeah, it's absolutely free. There will be some listed here. Are some of the very specific database related um, sessions that we have. Um, the deep guys will be walking through some of those best practices David referenced earlier. Kind of going all the way down and kind of tying that in how how to get the most performance and availability uh, with it SQL or Oracle. Um, and then we have a deep dive with ERA, just specifically kind of diving through that. Um, but this is the first time we've done it, uh, both free and online, um, just to stay the world and take advantage of it. There's a lot more sessions out there. There's they have different things from virtualization to um, new product announcements and like being able to get your hands in and uh, do some hands-on labs with that as well. So take advantage of that, kind of jump on that and get registered. And, and we're gonna have some great speakers available as well. So um, 
want to point you to one other thing. Um, after this, if you want to go go through the same process that David was doing in his demo, go to Nutanix.com slash test dash era, um, and you'll be able to uh, spin up databases. You'll have like a walkthrough. You have a walk me on things to click on. So um, it's not a video. It's actually you actually setting up the databases and deploying them in your environment or in uh, an online environment. Um, they are Postgres, I believe. I and mean, is it MariaDB databases? Is that correct, David? Correct. That is, it, you will deploy a MariaDB database and you will uh, clone and refresh a clone for a Postgres SQL. And that is a real live running environment. That is not any fakery going on behind the scenes. It is a running uh, environment on a, on a Nutanix cluster. Awesome. So um, thanks for your time. Thanks for joining David and I. I uh, wanted to leave time for some questions. Um, on any that have come through. Excellent presentation, David and Chris. Uh, really cool stuff you all are doing there with ERA. Um, we do have some questions for you from the audience. Uh, first one that came in here, uh, Mohammed, he's asking uh, what the licensing model is for ERA. So we have uh, two licensing models right now. Um, it is per vCPU, so you don't have to run. It's basically um, any databases that you have uh being managed um by era are uh it's like our ad hoc so it's that per vcpu of what you're managing uh the other way is if uh that we've been that we just started it's a platform model so um it's includes it's everything that you see hci as well as era and it's a per uh core model so uh anything and everything that are on those uh physical cores get uh included so um you have two licensing models depending on how you jump into it um usually somebody that's you know either has a new project they're spinning up a new environment or they're net new to new tanks altogether they'll generally use that um new tanks platform model if it's somebody that's already using nutanix and they want they, they're running databases today but they want to just jump in and kind of manage it they'll you know or they want to dip their toes in the water um with a couple you know of instances and they can go the per vcpu model Nice, nice. Okay, I like that flexibility. Another question here, they're asking uh, if Error runs on only AHV or other hypervisors as well. You want to take that, David? Yeah, so Error will run on and support uh, VMs running on ESXi and AHV. And uh, I didn't show it in that demo, but actually the management, or I'm sorry, it doesn't have it in that one. Uh, but yes, you can manage an ESXi server with Nutanix running Error running on it um, and also AHV. So it does not have to be an AHV environment. And it will deploy, mm -hmm. if you're doing an on ESXi, it will deploy it with all the, you know, Nutanix best practices for running databases on ESXi <laughs> and SQL Server's best practice, as well as AHV. Okay, nice. And then there's a question here from Eric. Um, he's asking, beyond the era management tool, uh, what other advantages are there of running databases uh, with era as compared to public cloud solutions like i guess the question might be changed into why not run it on a, a database on a public cloud instead so i'll start off and david you can fill in any gaps i i have um so the question is or i guess the way to how you rephrased it is if you're running nutanix to begin with and you're an existing Nutanix customer and you're running uh in the cloud and you want to run it in the cloud um you have cost benefits associated if like if that data and your workload actually needs to be on premises or if you're going to pick up and it's not in the cloud already are you going to take on that um that added cost and time and effort to put it into the cloud where you could keep it on premises but still get all the benefits of cloud with that um to kind of make that muddy the waters a little bit is today uh we announced uh we announced the uh, availability of Nutanix clusters. So that's um, running bare metal um, Nutanix nodes in AWS as of today, um, where if you, and I know they said Azure, but if you were running, uh, if, if you were, you had workloads that needed to live in AWS, uh, you now have a central pane of glass to have a truly hybrid cloud management system to kind of manage that, that entire environment. Um, both databases that are on premises or, um, or in uh, AWS at that point. So you, you can manage it all from the same spot. Um, you can ha have uh, 
the ability to provision and clone up to the cloud and then manage it, um, uh, you know, from on premises. And if you have like a failover scenario where like your primary was uh, on premises and then fail up to the cloud, you could do that as well. Um, that's a great benefit there. Um, the other big thing about it is, uh, it, again, it depends on the type of workload you're planning on doing, right? If if you're very familiar with the Azure tool set um, and you're okay with running all that environment on there and then switching gears and running into a different tool set uh, and management um, tool set and running it on premises, that's fine. But a lot of people like to keep that under, you know, kind of that workflow under kind of one umbrella. Yeah, I think you hit it. It's 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 always going to come down to honestly, it's going to come down to the same discussions you always have with cloud. What is your cost and performance going to dictate? Is it better to run it in the cloud or is it better to run it on premises? Generally, you're going to get better performance on premises, especially with the the way our HCI is architectured. But there's still a cost, performance, and you know analysis. It's the eternal cloud discussion. <laughs> But I do think our management and and even even without Era, just the ability to manage the Nutanix environment is way easier <laughs> than than even I was with other with other uh, you know virtualization products, whether they be in the cloud or um, you know other competitors. But yeah, I mean you know it's easy to do stuff in AWS. It's not as easy to uh, track it as always, you know, and track that cost. Absolutely, yeah. All right, great answer. Uh, well, it looks like we're running out of time here in today's webinar uh, event uh, for Q&A. So a lot of good questions coming in. Uh, we'll have to get back to those after the event. Before we go, I do want to award the Visa $300 gift card that's going out to Doug Jacobson from Virginia. Congratulations. We'll reach out to you to deliver that gift card. I also want to remind everyone to check out the resources there in the handouts tab and also the resources you see here on the screen. You can actually just mouse over those links on the screen and click on those and it will open a new browser tab or window. Uh, I wanna thank Chris and David, really great presentation. Thank you for the demo. Thank you for having us. Yeah, no problem. And, and don't forget if you wanna do this yourself, head over to Test Drive, you can do everything. A lot of what I showed you with Postgres there. Absolutely. Yeah, I love the test drive option. Free, easy to do, you know, do it all in your browser. The link is right there in the handouts tab, test drive era. If you click on that, that'll take you to the era test drive and you can give this a try for yourself. Thank you to Nutanix for supporting today's event. Uh, watch out for the future events in this series on powering up your databases. We've got five more events still remaining with the next event being August 25th at three o'clock Eastern. Hope to have you on that event as well. Uh, thank you to everyone in the audience for joining us. Have a great day, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.